I was still considered to be a trustworthy, good-tempered horse, so as a reward I still drove the Earl's wife, harnessed with the bearing rein. I, for four long months I suffered this way, growing more irritable and worn out each day. But I remembered my mother's advice and continued to do the best that I could. I didn't know how much longer I could endure this. Luckily, the Earl and his family left Earl Shaw Park for an extended visit. There was no need for the bearing rein then, and the horses that were left behind were used only for riding. The head groom, Reuben Smith, was left in charge of the stables. He was a well-liked man who knew horses thoroughly. One day he rode me into town to attend to some business. I was left in the care of a hostler at an inn. Somewhere along the journey, a nail had started to loosen in one of my front horseshoes. The hostler didn't notice it until later in the day. When Reuben finally returned for me, it was well into the evening, and he was in a terrible mood. Shall I fix this nail for you, sir? asked the hostler. No, no, replied Reuben coldly. The horse will be fine until we get home. I was surprised, for Reuben was usually very careful about things like that. But there was nothing I could do. I was saddled up, and we set off for Earl Shaw Park. I don't know why Reuben was in such a temper that night, but he was not the man I knew. As I galloped at full speed, he gave me frequent cuts of the whip. The roads were very stony, too, so my shoe became looser and looser. Soon, it came off entirely. Normally, Reuben would have noticed the change in my pace immediately, but because he was in such a terrible mood, I was forced to run my fastest while sharp stones cut into my split, shoeless hoof. I carried on as long as I could, but finally the pain was too great for me to even stand. I stumbled and fell to my knees. Reuben was flung off my back and landed with great force on sharp stones. He groaned and made an effort to rise, then lay completely still. I limped to the side of the road onto the soft grass and waited for someone, anyone, to approach. I could only stand there, quiet, helpless to do anything for Reuben or myself. Hours passed. Finally, two men appeared on horseback and stopped to help. At first, they thought I'd been careless and stumbled, but when they saw my broken hoof and damaged knees, they seemed to understand what had happened. Poor Reuben, though, paid the heaviest price of all. He was dead by the time the men arrived. In time, my broken knees healed, but the horse doctor said my scars would never fade. I was judged to be unfit for the Earl's stables and put up for sale. Ginger was upset by the news. You're my only friend and we'll probably never see each other again, she told me. On the day I left, we neighed sadly to each other until I could no longer hear her. My new master owned a stable full of horses and carriages that he rented out to people. Until now, I'd always driven by been driven by people who knew about horses. <laughs> but my new home was different. Here I was driven by whoever had the money to pay for me. It was hard work, and I became familiar with many different types of people. There were those who held the reins with such savage tightness that they made my mouth sore. Others were careless and held the reins so slack that they had absolutely no control over me. But probably the worst drivers were those who looked upon horses as machines. It made no difference to these drivers how heavy my load was, whether the road was rocky or muddy, or even if I was going uphill or down. They were determined to get their money's worth from me, no matter what it took. And so, even when I was struggling to do my best, they cut me with their whips and call me a lazy beast. This was my home for many months. Then I was brought to a horse fair to be sold. There were horses for every of every description at the fair, some young and handsome, others like me who were well-bred but had seen better days. And in the background, some sad-looking animals who had suffered from hard work and abuse. I was poked and prodded by many people. They pulled my mouth open and checked my legs and watched me trot so that they could see my pace. But in the end, my scarred knees prevented me from being sold. People were afraid that I would stumble and fall easily, and there was no way for me to explain what had really happened. Toward the end of the day, just when I was wondering if I would ever have a new home, 
two men approached the salesman. They couldn't have been more different. The first was very loud and unpleasant and reminded me of the kinds of people I had put up with as a hired horse. I hoped he would not buy me. The other, though, had a kind voice and spoke gently. I could tell by the way he handled me that he knew a lot about horses, and I was sure I would be happy with him. The two began bargaining for me. I feared that the unpleasant man would get me, for he seemed to have more money. But the man with the kind voice made the final offer, and with the salesman sold, my life as a London cab horse began.